as Birdman is still recovering. He's hoping that he's going to feel better uh, and well enough to at least submit a couple reviews, I believe, for next week's show. We'll see how he's doing as you've been probably following him. Uh, His gallbladder liver uh, woes have been quite debilitating, uh, and, and obviously his health is the most important thing here, so he is off recovering he has a couple times said i want to come back and record and i've said no you're not coming back until you feel good and no longer feel like bloody death (laughs) uh the show is as you're listening now uh out a day late almost a day and a half late almost two days late and the reason for that is uh not just me doing it solo but this past weekend, when I would normally have been recording, I went and got uh, my first uh, vaccination shot. So I had uh, the Pfizer, uh, I guess, was it Fire, Pfizer BioNTech, whatever it's called, shot uh, through my uh, local health uh, system. And uh, I qualified based on some health issues. Uh, I was considered in a high risk category. We're going to put that in quotes, high risk, not the highest risk. And I'm not one of the old people. So I'm in a different category altogether. Um, But that meant I was able to actually go in because they're like, yeah, you you need to get your shot now. And I went, yes, I would like my shot now, please. (laughs) Actually, I I was told by my family doctor, hey, Alex, you should go book this. I've, you know, checked you out and pre-qualified you. You're good. Contact uh, this yada, 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 sign up and see how long it takes you. So I signed up last Monday, and then they, or the, no, sorry, the Friday, was a good Friday I signed up, and then like the Monday, they said, hey, uh, you're a, you're qualified, uh, schedule your appointment now. And I went, okay, I'll schedule my appointment. What's the earliest I can go? And they're like, Saturday, the following Saturday. And I went, okay, what time can I go? They're like, you can go at 10 in the morning. And I went, I would rather not. So I went to uh, one of the later times, which is actually like almost 7 p.m. right before they're closed. And uh, got there, got in a little earlier than expected, uh, had my shot, did waited my 15 minutes because they want to make sure you don't have any allergic reactions. And then uh, waited for my uh, uh, mobility transit slash cab home. So get home, um, feeling pretty good. Um, a little tender, like standard stuff. Uh, I go to bed, I wake up the next day and I'm like, oh, so I am having some of those, those, uh, side effects, the initial ones that are really super common in that my, my arm was a little swollen and it was super tender to move it around. Uh, and I was stupid tired. Like we're talking beyond, like, I was like, I was so tired that I couldn't sleep. I'm like, oh, I'm so tired, but I, I can't sleep. So I tried reading and stuff, and and I was like lethargic. I'm like, I can't, I don't have enough energy to record like I normally do on Sunday. I'm like, I I could power my way through a show or try to do a review or two, but I was like, it's going to come across as me being super duper tired. Nobody wants to hear that. Tired podcaster means tired audience. Like, oh my god. So I went. Let me see. I'll I'll record Monday morning. Uh, I'll, I'll give myself some time to go to bed. I'll take a quick nappy poo. So my little nappy poo starts at 7 p.m. And uh, I then wake up at 1 in the afternoon the next day on Monday. And I went, well, I missed my morning recording time. 
but holy crap, am I was I tired? Um, woke up. I was like, well, I I was actually going to be playing some games and stuff for a review, but I was still sort of tired. And I went, okay, well, what have I completed? What can I record? And I went, I've got a couple items, a first couple VR titles to record, which I'll get into here a little later. And I thought, uh, I'm I'm taking, I'm going to see if I can get it out late tonight, maybe in the morning the next day. Well, I end up going to bed at a regular time. By regular, I mean like old people time of like 9 p.m. And then I wake up again at like one in the afternoon today, super energized. All my energy is back, more than I've had in, in actually quite some time. And my arm feels better. The swelling's gone down. Everything's normal. I'm like super ready to go. And I went, well, I completely missed the second deadline I was going to do. So I'm recording this around dinner time. And I'm like, I'll just get it out anytime tonight because I have to get it out because I wanted to get it out. And uh, we will be back to a regular schedule starting next week so we're like 7 a.m eastern time on monday it's just this the uh, two weeks ago you know we took a week off because uh, of easter and it was just i was completely burnt out uh, a lot of weeks of doing stuff on my own plus we had sort of exhausted our pipeline of review items there were some that we were waiting on coming but of course long weekend slows everything down there was almost no news so some of this news will be from last week that we recycled that maybe wasn't talked about very often uh by other people and some is going to be new um the other big thing is i did finally get an oculus quest 2 so through shenanigans shenanigans i say (laughs) i had a uh gift card a sizable one that i could redeem for uh best buy through my bank uh through like a rewards program and then it turns out it wasn't activated and man yada yada rabble rabble uh had saved up some money from tax returns slash uh just just like leftover even birthday money that i squirreled away that i was like i'm gonna use this you know for stuff that i want instead of stuff that i need like just little bits here and there and they had a sale on the oculus and i went you know what we have been offered a bunch of VR titles in the past, not just for Oculus, but for PC in general. And I know that the Oculus Quest 2 does support the tethering to PC if you want to for titles on Steam. I'm like, I'm like I know we sometimes get VR titles on Steam to, and we just have had to always turn them down. And I went, you know, I, let's, I'm going to bite the bullet. I'm going to actually pick it up. So it finally arrives. I get it set up. Uh, I've, I've got some stuff coming actually on the way. Uh, some accessories to check out from a a company or two that we'll get into. So there's going to be a fair bit of VR content coming over the next several weeks and and probably months as things roll out. But I've had a pretty good time with it. I had to get used to it initially, mostly because I'm not used to uh, playing in a 3D space. So I had to figure out how to set up the Guardian, which is, you know, making sure you don't walk outside of that space. Uh, I've I've got myself... uh, a third party uh, from Cable Matters, long 15 foot USB A to USB C, 5 gigabit active cable. That's very important when you go beyond the 10 foot range. Getting an active cable ensures that it's got like some capacitors and stuff in there that store the power and, and repeat it so that no matter what, you're getting a consistent signal the entire time. Uh, so that way we could plug it into the computer and, and work that way through it. Uh, for tethering or for updates or for playing um, uh, or for putting it in developer mode because I was, putting it in developer mode lets you put on uh, like side loading apps and stuff from indie stores to try out a bunch of cool fun stuff you can do none of this obviously it doesn't void your warranty it doesn't affect anything it's all completely normal stuff um, and I was like okay well I could do it with the little cable it comes with or they want me to pay like 50 bucks for their own when for 20 bucks I can get a Cable Matters cable that has really good reviews. So I got that. Uh, I got a silicon cover for the face mask because it gets a little sweaty and it's kind of scratchy, the material that it comes with. And we've that I've tried that out, and that's going to be my baseline when comparing to uh, other you know more prominent VR companies that are making accessories that we might be receiving stuff for. Uh, I picked up two games on my own that with out of my own pocket and then i went broke (laughs) uh only because obviously this was a chunk of change that i spent on it in the first place but i picked up two games one was trover saves the universe which i have not tried out yet um 
just because there's other stuff that's come uh, that is made by the Rick and Morty people, Justin Roiland, and the other was Beat Saber because I, I'd heard that that was the killer app and that was what you should get, and it really, really is. Uh, I've played. I'm, I'm playing it on easy, and I've been doing it. Two things. I've been doing it mostly sitting down because I just didn't set up enough space to do it standing. But I will be trying that out later. Uh, and I've tried it even from bed. It's a little awkward at first, but you get used to it. If, you're, if you are a little restless and you can't sleep, you put your headset on with some headphones and play a little Beat Saber on easy because you can't really reach some of the really difficult ones when you're laying down. But if you'll get your arms going, you'll get your heart rate going, you'll get tired, and you'll go right to bed. Believe me. Uh, I've only purchased one song for it. There are some packages. None of them really super appeal to me. But there was the Panic at the Disco High Hope song. And I was like, two bucks. I think that would be a good fit. And I've played it a ton. Like, it's been totally worth the purchase. I'm not totally sold on the other songs and packs. Like, the Linkin Park one doesn't sound right to me. But it might for you. Uh, my brother told me that the PC version of it lets you load up your own songs and make your own things. I didn't see an option for that here. So, uh, And it, it doesn't have a cross-buy feature or, or anything that way. But it is well worth the money, even for the base songs. You get a, a fair amount completely free, multiple packages that are that were updated. And I'm now coming into it when I have, after it's been out for a while, uh, I get the advantage of having a lot of those packages already included with the download. I tried some VR stuff, I uh, like video stuff. I uh, did pay for what's it called Skybox VR or something, where you can play your own media that you've copied over from PC. So I had to go into my collection. Uh, I was like, what do I have on the DVD shelf that I can uh, make a backup of and pop on there and, and give it a go? Uh, so I tried out a couple VR, or sorry, I tried a couple 3D movies, not realizing. I was like, hey, you know what? This might work. That 3D movies, it does, it knows how to interpret the 3D side by side. And actually, without having a 3D TV, which we haven't had since my brother had an LG and we all lived together years ago, he had when we had the PS3 era a, uh, an LG TV that allowed for 3D to work with just the theater glasses, not active glasses. You could just pick up those polarized glasses you get for free from the real 3D. You know, you know they always say like, "Oh, deposit these at the end of the movie." Well, we kept a couple, and they worked perfectly with his television and 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 the uh, PS3 hooked up. Well, it's been years. He moved out. I moved out. We moved to different areas, and this is the first time that I've actually been able to take advantage of some of those. DVDs, or sorry, some of those Blu-rays I have that included a 3D movie. So, putting it in, uh, they play just fine. It took a little while. You had to get used to controlling the 3D space and, and making the visually appealing, uh, because it's not filling up your entire eyesight, because then it's too close. So, you, you get it filling up about 75-80% to 80 of, the, of the visual area of your, your eyesight, and it plays in 3D. Like, you can see it popping out at you. Is it as dramatic as watching it on an actual 3D TV? No. I will tell you that right now. Uh, 3D films on in the, the 3D headset do not look as good as 3D, and the 3D effect is not as strong as on an actual, like, LG or whatever 3D television. But it is the only way I've been able to actually watch my 3D movies. Uh, and then, just as a, a joke, I had to go through my DVD collection and I had to watch the pilot episode for VR Troopers uh, and uh, 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 Superhuman Samurai Cyber Squad because, I mean, it's, it's about VR. <laughs> so I had to watch them. That was uh, sort of hilarious, watching Standard Def Video on there. Uh, it does a pretty good job of applying filters, so that software was worth, the, I think it was eight or nine bucks to purchase. Well worth it. You can watch your your uh, your videos on there. I even loaded up like some 4K stuff to see because it's a 4K screen, and it was flawless. You could see it just fine. I still would prefer 4K HDR visuals to play on my big TV, but you know you can watch it there just fine. I logged into uh, what was it? YouTube, Netflix, and I haven't logged into to my Amazon Prime and VR yet, but I'm assuming it's a similar thing where it gives you a 3D viewing theater space and you watch the stuff in there. I watched some 3D, uh, full, like 180 3D, which is 180 degrees, and full 360 uh, VR on YouTube, some music videos, pretty neat stuff, uh, works great, and uh, playing your own media works pretty pretty well, actually, and those that's what I've, my experience with purchasing things for it so far. Later on in the show, we're going to have a couple reviews from uh, uh, 
one from uh, Limited Run Games, which is interesting. We didn't get sent a physical copy. We got a digital copy of a game that they're publishing. Uh, and then we also received two games from uh, uh, End Dreams, which ha- are VR for the Oculus, uh, Shooty Fruity, and Phantom uh, Covert Ops. So we'll be uh, featuring that later on in the show. Uh, as for the news and weird news, Birdman has helped curate these. Uh, I'll be going into them. It's going to be a fairly quick and breezy show that way, uh, th- probably three or four stories each. And then we'll come back at the end to sort of say, you know, what's coming and what's what we're doing over the next couple weeks of the show. So without further ado, let's get into our first review. Basically, he's a geeks. Leave me alone, geek boy. Holy shit, you geeks are badass. It's about time we got to review another visual novel game, and this time it comes to us via Limited Run Games. Uh, they sent over a digital copy for us to check out on the Nintendo Switch of The House in Feta Morgana Dreams of the Revenants uh, Edition. That This was released previously on the PlayStation platform, uh, platforms, I, I should say, and it's the, the first time that they have published it on uh, the Nintendo Switch. So what I received is a digital code, but they are having uh, a physical release of it coming up later this month. Uh, so if you want it digitally, you can get it now. I'll just say that now, and I'll give a little more description on the physical at the end. So uh, this is a very different Japanese visual novel game in that usually they're done in a very anime cutesy like over the top sort of style that you see from uh like manga anime this has a more gothic look it's a, it's a little different than what you're maybe used to a little closer in style to if you remember from the playstation 2 era there were, was it shadow hearts i think uh where it's this sort of mixture not quite castlevania-y but a little bit in that style mixed with the the art style of like a western like a european artist mixed if if, what if a european artist did anime (laughs) that's probably the best way to describe it uh it it is gorgeous because these are based on the 4k visuals that were redone for uh the re-release on the playstation 4 a little while ago uh and then of course scaled to fit the the switch's resolution now uh included with this i should say that there are uh technically three games in one uh there is the base game which is the uh the house in feta morgana then there is a requiem uh a requiem of innocence which is a prequel and then there is uh reincarnation which is a sequel um there's voice acting involved in here there's uh one of the best soundtracks i've ever heard for a visual novel game something that i was not expecting usually it's not that it's like stock music they'll use or or you know, like B-quality music would probably be the best way to put it. Uh, this has a, a very soothing, somber, melodic soundtrack that uh, I'm going to have to maybe hunt down myself so that I can just have and put it on a playlist or something to play in the background when I want to just, you know, do a bunch of emails or work and, and have something going on in the background because it's very well put together. It's a visually striking game. Uh, it gets off to a bit of a slow start, but it does pick up steam as you go and you get more and more involved. So if maybe the first hour of gameplay uh, doesn't pull you in 100%, stick with it because it's very well done after that fact. That's the only real downside I can see is that it's just a little bit slow at the very beginning and that the audio while fantastic soundtrack notwithstanding uh because it's on the switch it's a little more compressed than i would have liked it still sounds great but i would have loved uh maybe an option to get a a more lossless soundtrack or something at a higher bit rate which again to each his own i am a bit of an audio nut so it's it's something worth tracking down you know soundtrack wise for me now i don't want to get too deep into the plot but the basic premise is uh there's a spirit at the beginning of the game that meets a maid uh, in this mansion, you know, the titular uh, house. And you're viewing past events that jump through multiple time periods to learn sort of what happened to all the residents of the the mansion. Uh, And and you're sort of regaining memories as the spirit. Uh, And it's quite an interesting way how they handle it because it's pretty, like, big, different time travel uh, uh periods like your 1600s 1700s 1800s and then you know middle ages like the just before i think it's like the year 1099 so right the 
middle ages right in the very smack dab in the middle um as far as gameplay goes it's your standard uh visual novel where you're you're seeking options to then move the story forward you're picking uh the dialogue tree that you'll move down to to get to your different ending the interface uh loads pretty quickly on the switch which is good uh the menu lets you go uh you know, select the different versions of the game or select the different games, essentially. And there's also uh, a quick save option that you can just click a button and quick save and come back to. So I, that's useful if you, you know, make a mistake or you think that you've gone down the wrong path that you didn't want to go down. Uh, it's also able, uh, you're able to save the game pretty much at any time with, with a full save slot. And there's plenty of save slots you can choose from because being that it's a visual novel game, it's just basically saving what part of the tree you're on. Uh, I had not heard of this before, but it's had a bit of a history history in that it was released on uh, PC, iOS, 3DS, Vita, uh, PS4, and now Switch. Uh, they've obviously been doing something good with it. it it's done well for them uh, that it's been remastered, you know, on, on PS4 and now uh, the Switch. Uh, I would say it's worth picking up. I think it might be worth, dig- or like, sorry, physical more than digital uh, in that you know, digital, it's fine, but here's the interesting thing. This is one of those limited run games that isn't going to have a set amount of pre-orders. So uh, the pre-orders end on April 25th. So uh, at, I think it's 12 p.m. or 11.59 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Uh, so you can pick it up for 50 uh, is sort of the baseline for uh, 50 US dollars. Then there's uh, also a collector's edition. But the base game comes with everything on all three games on one cartridge, uh, as well as uh, a full color interior art and full color booklet, stuff that you're pretty much used to getting from Limited Run. But the fact that it's uh, an open pre order where they're not having a limit on it is great for those people that are, you know, on the fence or worried that they're not going to get it because all the ones that they've had that come out that aren't pre order uh, on Limited pre-orders when they launch you know that they get scalped up real fast uh if you wanted to go with the collector's edition uh you're looking at 85 bucks uh us and that eh, that includes a fair bit more it's in a larger box uh it also includes uh a reversible 18 by 24 poster uh high quality art cards and a six disc soundtrack that's what i would want because the music is almost the best part of this game. Uh, and then there's also a 10 by 7 art book. So that that's actually well worth it. Uh, and it looks like it's an open pre-order as well. So if you're looking to get into this style of gothic visual novel, it's probably one of the better ones out there. And you're getting a fantastic soundtrack with some pretty beautiful visuals included. The Prime Minister of Sweden visited Washington today, and my tiny little nipples went to France. Gossip, rumors, panic in the streets. We're lucky. This Week in Geek News. For our first news story, uh, Birdman brought us this. This is from cbc.ca. HBO's The Last of Us adaptation to shoot in Calgary area starring Mandalorian, Game of Thrones actors. Uh, So it says here, HBO's adaptation of the hit video game series The Last of Us will begin production in Calgary this July, uh, according to the Directors Guild of Canada. They generally have to report these things way ahead of time when they're getting their permission and everything. Uh, The Guild lists The Last of Us, which will star Pedro Pascal, The Mandalorian, and Bella Ramsey uh, uh, of Game of Thrones as starting production in the province on July 5th, wrapping up on... June 8th, 2022. That's a long shoot. I guess maybe they're they're breaking it up for specific reasons, but that's for a, a single season of a show. Is it, I wonder if it's like a mini series. I don't know if they're going to go multiple seasons, but like usually you don't take a full year. Anyway, uh, Calgary's Union for Film and Stage Technicians and International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, wow, it's a mouthful, also lists the series as being scheduled for production this July. Craig Mazin, who created HBO's acclaimed Chernobyl series, is set to write and executive produce the series, along with Neil Druckmann, who directed the video games. Uh, The Last of Us takes place in a post-apocalyptic world 20 years after modern civilization has been destroyed. According to HBO, the story focuses on Joel, a hardened survivor who is hired to smuggle 14-year-old Ellie out of an oppressive quarantine zone. Uh, what starts as a small job transforms into a brutal, heartbreaking journey as they traverse the U.S. and depend on each other for survival, the network said in its release. 
Pedro Pascal, who played Oberyn Martell in the in the HBO series Game of Thrones, who you might remember for getting his head crushed in and exploding all over the place on camera by by the mountain. He's crushed his head with his eyes, but boom, and popped like a melon and just exploded everywhere. It's amazing. <laughs> Will star as Joel. Bella Ramsey, who played uh, Liana Mormont on Game of Thrones, will star as Ellie. Representatives for HBO didn't respond to requests for comments, but rumors of a massive production have been swirling in Calgary for months. That is massive. It's that long. It says, during uh, a Facebook live stream held on Wednesday, Alberta premier Jason Kenney hinted at a very exciting announcement coming this week. Uh, it will be the largest ever, I believe, for film or television production in Canadian history. Uh, in a statement, the Press Secretary for Jobs, Economy, and Innovation, Minister Doug Schweitzer, said, uh, Alberta is on track for a record year in film, with new privately funded studios in the process of being built to meet demand. It must not just be this. It must be a bunch are going to be filmed there. There's a lot more open spaces. There's a lot of... I, I've seen a lot more shows being filmed in uh alberta and saskatchewan and manitoba for either here here, like period pieces and things but i could totally see this being done you can make it look like pretty much anywhere in the states uh it says here the original last of us video game was released in 2013 to critical acclaim we this isn't really big news but we have heard that uh they're planning to do a remake it's not even been 10 years we're not going to get into that. That might be something to discuss when we do another <laughs> uh, another prototype episode where we'll discuss like when it's too soon for a remake or what should be remade. Yeah, that, that's a good topic we should talk about. It says here, the game sold more than 20 million copies as of 2019, becoming one of the highest selling PS3 video games of all time. The series will, in quotes, enhance uh, the events of the original game, uh, they said in an interview. Uh, I can't say much about this other than say that one anxiety I think fans have of something uh, like this is when the property gets licensed to someone else, these people don't really understand it or are going to change or make it stupid. Uh, In this case, I'm doing uh, it with the guy who did it, Mizzen said. So the changes that we're making are designed to uh, fill things out and expand, not to undo, but rather to expand. Uh, Mezen said the series has become a dream come true for him because he's a fan of the series himself. I'm a little scared because everybody's emotions connected to this game are rather intense. Uh, It says here, Alberta's film industry has been prepping for a booming year as major U.S. studios have looked north due to COVID-19 slowdowns. Uh, Damian Petty, local president of the crazy long name (laughs) uh, industry uh, that we talked about earlier, previously told CBC News... Uh, that certain tax credits are making Alberta a more enticing location to shoot as well. Last week, Schweitzer announced that the province would remove a cap that limited film and television productions to a maximum 10 million tax credit claim uh, in a bid to draw larger projects to the province. We're starting to see continued momentum in this field. Upcoming series shooting in the Calgary area include the series Guilty Party with Kate Beckinsale, a Fraggle Rock reboot, another season of CBC's Heartland. Uh, that's all that's been announced so far, and there's supposed to be a bigger announcement. Maybe we'll talk about it next week. Since 2000, the Calgary area has succeeded in attracting big, several big-budget productions to film in the area. In 2013, when Interstellar uh, and the first season of the FX series Fargo filmed in the area, the total value of the industry reached $274 million. I mean, that's pretty cool. Um, it's a good place to film it. You can film it cheaper than in the States, but at the same time, maintaining high production values because you're using Canadian crews, but they're Canadian crews that are used to making high budget American films now. So this isn't a case of, Hey, we're going to go film it in Bulgaria and you, and we have to use their people and they're not experienced. And then everything looks like a really bad Steven Seagal movie. (laughs) This is a case of so many people will watch this, not even realize it's, it's Canada and, and at the same time be a boom to our economy. So that's great. Uh, the next story, we have two more here, but the next story is from ComingSoon.net. Netflix acquires Knives Out franchise in $400 million deal. It says here, last February saw the exciting announcement that Lionsgate had greenlit a sequel to Ryan Johnson's acclaimed whodunit Knives Out. Uh, but now the franchise is seeing a major shift as Netflix is closing in on a deal to acquire the rights to the second and third installments of the series, according to Deadline. 
Sources report that the deal came from a discreet bidding war between Apple, Amazon, and Netflix to acquire the rights, which is owned and licensed by Johnson and his producing partner uh, and T Street co-founder uh, Ram Bergman on a picture-by-picture basis. Though it's currently unclear as to why the duo uh, elected to sell the rights uh, to the murder mystery films to a streaming platform, word notes that Netflix won out the auction by approximately $450 million deal. The first film was acquired by Media Rights Capital, who sold it to Lionsgate, and sources report helps uh, sell the follow-ups to Netflix. In addition to the sale, exciting word has, uh, word has broken to the first of the sequels is expected to begin shooting in Greece, on June 28th, with casting uh, set to begin immediately. <clears throat> Knives Out first hit theaters in 2019 to rave reviews from critics, garnering three Golden Globe nominations and an Oscar nod for Best Original Screenplay, and was a smash hit at the box office, grossing over $311 million uh, on a global box office on its budget of $40 million. The original paid tribute to the celebrated works of Agatha Christie, plotting a modern-day murder mystery in which the renowned crime novelist Harlan Tromblay, Tromblay or sorry, sorry, Harlan Thrombe is found dead at his estate uh, the morning after his 85th birthday, sparking the interest of the stylish private detective Benoit Blanc to investigate. Uh, weaving his way through the eccentric Thrombe family and his devoted staff, Blanc must uh, see through the intricate web of lies and red herrings to determine the truth behind his demise. Um, cool. Also, massive deal. Because they're figuring, okay, could it potentially make three hundred million each in, in theaters? Yeah, but we don't know what the theater market's going to be like over the next few years. This is a smart move. This is a guaranteed money maker. They're figuring on, okay, we're probably going to spend fifty million to make it, and we've already made our money back just in selling the rights here. And then Netflix is looking at it, going, well, this is a a, a marquee thing. This is something that they're going to people are going to either newly subscribe to or keep subscribed to watch stuff like this. This is a drop in the bucket for the amount of money that they receive every month. So, you know, it's totally worth it. I think it's pretty sweet. Um, I still haven't seen Knives Out. I, my, I know my mother saw it and didn't care for it, but my brother and his wife saw it and loved it. So I'll have to jump in and see how it goes. I'll, just, I'll have to watch it maybe this week because I've it's been on my list and I keep forgetting. Now... Our final story here of the regular news is from the Anime News Network. So it says, uh, Big West, Studio New, and Harmony Gold USA agree to a global distribution of Macross and Robotech. Uh, before even reading this, I have friends that are big into Macross, and, and I remember seeing Robotech as a kid and being a big fan. Uh, I know that there's some crazy stuff, because Harmony Gold is like a, a real estate company. They're not an anime company, and they're known to be as far, you know, knock don't hold me to this, but I believe they're supposed to be very litigious in that they are very strict about licensing. They don't like other people doing this. They, they're, they're, they've they're been very closed vest. There's been arguments between them and the original producers or something of the, the original anime that they based everything on because it was like two or three of them that were made into one show. It's the Voltron thing all over again. And there was a bunch of legal problems over the last 35 years or so. So let's see what this says. Maybe they're finally, you know, inking something and working something out. It says here, Harmony Gold USA announced on Friday that the companies agreed to allow immediate distribution of most Macross television sequels and films. The agreement signed on March 1st also confirms that Big West will, in quotes, will not oppose the Japanese release of an anticipated upcoming live action Robotech film. Oh, because there's they own the name or something, I think. Big you can correct me, contact us, uh, feedback at thisweekingeek.net or on social media if you can fill in the blanks for me here. Uh, Big West will no longer uh, contest Harmony Gold USA's exclusive license with Tatsunoko for the use of the 41 Macross characters and mecha designs in the Robotech television series and related merchandise outside Japan. The companies agreed to cooperate on the distribution of future Macross and Robotech products. Sounds like Harmony Gold needs money finally. Uh, Studio New launched the Macross franchise in 1982 with the Super Dimension Fortress Macross, uh, a television anime series featuring the themes of a love triangle, music, and transforming fighter planes. Studio New worked with the advertising agency Big West and the anime studio Tatsunoko Productions as production partners. 
Uh, the franchise spawned three more television series, Macross 7, Macross Frontier, and Macross Delta. Several theatrical films, starting with Super Dimension Fortress Macross Do You Remember Love, and several video series, including Macross 2, Macross Plus, Macross Dynamite 7, Macross Zero. Macross Delta ran from April to September 2016 after a preview of the first episode in 2015. A new Macross Delta feature film and a new Macross Frontier short will open this year. Overseas, Tatsunoko licensed very rights to the first Macross series as well as the two anime uh, series, Moss Peta and Southern Cross. That's the two that they, they used with it. That's right. To uh, licensing company Harmony Gold USA in 1984. Harmony Gold USA edited and rewrote the three shows into its 85 episode macro, or sorry, Robotech television series in 1985. Harmony Gold USA went on to produce sequels, including 1986 Robotech 2, The Sentinels, Robot- and 2006 uh, is Robotech The Shadow Chronicles. Harmony Gold USA also signed two live action Robotech motion picture deals in 2007 with Warner Brothers and 2016 with Columbia Pictures. No live action films have yet been released, but Jason Fuchs uh, from Wonder Woman. Uh, was writing a script for a uh, Robotech film. In, 19, in a 1991 agreement, Tatsunoko granted Harmony Gold the exclusive rights to exploit 36 episodes of Macross, 25 episodes of Moss Peta, and 23 episodes of Southern Cross for 10 years. The two companies extended the agreement in 1998, 2002, and then 2019. And it says here, litigation. Around 1998, Big West filed against Tatsunoko claiming that, claiming it, it, not Tatsunoko, had the rights to make sequels to Macross. Uh, a 2003 court decision ruled in favor of Tatsunoko, notably saying that Tatsunoko had the rights to license Macross to Harmony Gold USA, uh, but Big West retains the rights to 41 of the original designs used in the series. This is getting stupid. As a result of these proceedings, Tatsunoko and Harmony Gold USA's agreement in 1988 revoked Harmony Gold USA's right to make sequels to the three shows in question. But the 2002 agreement restored them for Mospita and Southern Cross only. A 2003 agreement restored Harmony Gold USA's right to make derivative works of Macross, except with uh, the designs owned by Big West. Tatsunoko disputed this 2003 agreement and its counterclaims, but the court upheld the agreement as valid. Also, as a result of these litigations, Tatsunoko asked Harmony Gold USA to protect Macross trademarks outside of Japan and agreed that Harmony Gold USA could uh, deduct legal fees uh, from royalties paid to Tatsunoko. Tatsunoko also disputed this agreement in counterclaims, but again, the court ruled in favor of Harmony Gold USA. This sounds like a mess. It sounds like they're finally working together because they want money. And they probably can't get enough on their own anymore. And they want that big th- theater or or s- streaming you know, movie money. And, I mean, sure. I think fans are probably just happy that they're good to go and that they're ready to finally do something maybe in, in the consumer's favor so that's going to do it for uh for the regular news here we're going to take a quick break and jump into uh a review of shooty fruity on the oculus vr system and when we come back it'll be ready to go with the weird news this is a fair request and i promise i will not judge any person only as a teenager and that this is no more right than saying all teenagers are drunken dope addicts or glue sniffers. This is a first for us. We are talking about a VR game. Yes, we finally got on board the VR train. Uh, We have an Oculus Quest 2 that we can use for uh, any VR reviews that uh, are supported, uh, either natively through the Oculus uh, store itself, uh, as well as through things like Steam Link, uh, so we can do uh, PC-based VR. Uh, Somewhat limited in that uh, what at least I'm dealing with is, and I believe Birdman has the same video card from the build we did, uh, our AMD Radeon 5500 XTs, which are VR certified, but you're you're not going to get like high, high high-end... VR experiences 
like you'd have to jump into the normal msrp of like six or seven hundred dollars but now we know that that market's crazy but it can do pretty much pretty much any vr game will run just fine you just won't be able to max it out if we're doing ones that are like that but that's beside the point the first game that we were sent for review uh is uh well we were sent two uh but the first one of this batch is from uh sent to us by our friends at uh end dreams uh this is shooty fruity so uh it is pretty much what it sounds like uh you are a new employee at a grocery store and the goal of the game is you uh pick up jobs or pick up uh, uh which is basically missions in the vr space uh which is interesting and uh it's sort of a shooting gallery but not your goal is to scan as many uh items through the checkout at a grocery store as you can uh you know using both arms picking up scanning putting over to the side and so on as sentient uh uh fruit and 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 you know like starts to come to life and attacks you think attack of the killer tomatoes sort of thing and you have a couple different you know, weapons you can choose from that are streaming by you. You pick up, you shoot at them, uh, shooting gallery style, and they, they will try to dodge or jump at you. And you kill as many of them as you can while racking up your score uh, from tra- uh, you know going through the checkout and everything. Uh, pretty cool. Uh, it's it's actually a fun interesting title like a lot of the i say appeal of vr is some of the more simplistic games that you would have seen in like the traditional arcade or or something from a bygone era where nowadays everything seems to be all graphics everything triple a this yada 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 this is something that can only really be properly experienced in vr that doesn't need to have super high-end graphics and yet it still appears to be that way it still has a feeling of being a very high polished game uh it is something that takes a bit of getting used to when it comes to uh the controls because you know part of my reaction i had to set up my boundary a little better around me because i, I almost like stabbed my monitor when i was pulling my gun out and trying to shoot thing because <laughs> i was sitting a little too close to my work desk and i went oh i gotta get used to this but it is a silly over the top game uh as far as is it friendly enough that anybody can play as long as you're not you know if you have kids and you're not too militant on like oh no guns at all ever even if it's cartoony violence uh this is pretty much a game anybody can play it, it kids aren't going to be too scared of it uh it's well put together well developed i didn't encounter any glitches i can see myself playing it uh fairly often actually picking up and play you can do this for a few minutes at a time or you can go uh an hour or two at a time and you won't get like overly tired like some of the more exercise type games are you can do it from sitting down you can do it from standing up so there's not really any restrictions there uh the audio design is quite good and you hear things coming from whatever direction that they're coming at at least you have your head turned to the left and you have an enemy coming from the right you'll hear them uh it's just a well put together arcadey style game and it's definitely worth checking out especially if you have an oculus Go crazy? Don't mind if I do! Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria! And it's time for the weird news. We've got three stories here that Birdman gathered. Uh, The first one here is from Kotaku. It says, man arrested following daring Pokemon card robbery. Okay. It says, a 28-year-old Tokyo resident has been arrested for allegedly breaking into a trading card shop uh, atop a six-story building to steal Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh cards. What is this, the 90s? (laughs) After climbing over uh, the side of the building with a rope. Oh my god. Okay. Uh, It says here, Minichi reports that the early morning hours last week, uh, Kensuke Kensuke Nakanishi... Uh, anchored a rope to a uh, railing on the roof of a building in uh, Higashi Ikabukuro. Police uh, say he climbed the nearly 16 and a half feet down the building without a safety wire, then broke into the store's window with some sort of tool. He was caught after being captured on security camera. Uh, Nakanishi is accused of stealing around 80 cards of Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! worth $9,120 uh and another 2370 in cash or sorry 2370 in cash the suspect has uh confessed saying he did it to pay off a debt i was uh, in a rock climbing club, a club in high school he said so i wasn't afraid of heights 
just a short and quick story and and grand theft card i guess uh i mean you add it up a little over 10 g's what uh, that's is it worth it it's worth going to jail over that probably not but it's still kind of funny uh the next story here is uh birdman found this this was uh from the local it says here wind of justice uh austrian man fined for farting on police has sentence reduced on appeal uh it says here the viennese man was given the fine after letting wind escape loudly it says in quotes uh, last june following an identity check by police at a park uh the news made headlines across the world forcing vienna police to issue a clarification on social, social media that in quotes of course no one will be reported for accidentally letting one go once uh the man has uh, had challenged the fine saying although he had farted uh this was a biological process which uh would have amounted to freedom of expression even if it had been done deliberately the administrative court reduced the penalty from 500 euros to 100 euros, pointing out the man's lack of criminal record while saying uh, saying he only had average culpability for the offense. Uh, the, the Vienna Regional Administrative Court stated that the, uh, in its ruling that the man was on the park bench and when he lifted his buttocks and let the wind escape in a way which was perceived by everyone present. The man's friend laughed and joked about the innocent, uh, incident. According to administrative court, the basic right to freedom of communication is not limited to a certain form of communication, but the statement was also uh, contain a communicative uh, content. However, this is not the case with pure body stimuli, the court said, according to the newspaper report. Uh, it concluded that even if it were accepting the farting, uh, that farting were to accept an act of communication, the wind would have to be a, in quote, form of expression that transcends the boundaries of decency the court added uh, form of action seems suitable to a completely undermine any state uh, order and to make it ridiculous according to Der Standard newspaper uh, the paper also features comments from Paul Eberstaller university assistant at the uh, uh, Jur <laughs> good lord today uh, juridicum uh, who says the ruling sh uh, shows how problematic the offense of decency is, particularly when comparing public and private life. If a private person had been a victim in this case, public decency would not have been violated. Basically, if you fart on somebody in your home, nothing happens. Uh, in addition, the authorities would, not, uh, would probably not pursue the complaints from private individuals. At the time, legal uh, protection is often lacking evidence of actual problems. He said, my question is, what if you had an actual medical condition? IBS or you know you, you've got medical problems that you, you you can't control your flashes and you get up and it comes out and it's really loud uh, would you have been able to argue that hey, I have a disability I can't control when this happens um, so I, it all depends I guess maybe not in uh, maybe not in uh, Austria but still yeah a guy got arrested for farting and had to pay 100 euro <laughs> and our last quick story here uh, this is from CTV News. So this is Canadian. Uh, Minnesota woman set, sets field swamp on fire in maple syrup mishap. This is the most Canadian thing ever, even though it's it's Minnesota. It says here, this is reported from Ottawa. A woman in Minnesota accidentally set a field and a swamp on fire while making maple syrup. According to the uh, Stearns County Sheriff's Office, officers were called to a residence in uh, Albany, Minnesota, about 150 kilometers northwest of Minneapolis, following a report uh, of a grass fire that had gotten out of control. Officers said upon arrival, it was determined that a 41-year-old woman uh, who owned the property started the fire, uh, in quotes, while in the process of cooking maple syrup. Due to the uh, wind at the time of the incident, the neighboring field and swamp caught fire. I don't know how a swamp catches fire. Maybe let me know. I have no idea. Uh, and she was unable to extinguish it with a water hose that she had nearby. Uh, the Stearns County Sheriff's Office wrote in a news release. Firefighters were eventually able to contain the fire and the woman was ticketed for starting a fire during a burn ban. Um, again, short, quick story, but sh so it's not a moonshine fire. This wasn't a, a distillery that went up. It was uh, 
a sugar fire. <laughs> that sweet, sweet maple syrup, which is a multi-billion dollar industry. That <laughs> That's what caused this. This is ridiculous. Uh, it's the most Canadian story ever, even though it's American. So, I mean, Minnesota is basically Canada. Let's be honest here. So that's going to do it for the weird news. Like I said, it's a shorter segment this week. Uh, partially because Alex is tired still from his <laughs> from his COVID shot, and he's going to be taking a little bit to get back up completely normal. Yes, I woke up with a ton of energy today, but that's starting to wear thin. So we're going to go to our final review of uh, this week, which is Phantom Covert Op from uh, End Dreams. And then we'll be back with the closing thoughts on the show and what's coming up and everything. So without further ado, let's get into the review. Do you have any hobbies? I collect spores, molds, and fungus. Hold that thought. It's crapper time. I mentioned earlier that we received two games as the first VR review titles uh, for our Oculus Quest 2 uh, from the same company, this being End Dreams. The first was Shooty Fruity that you would have probably heard reviewed earlier in the show, and the second one is Phantom Covert Ops. Now, if that rings a bell, that was something we had actually talked about, ooh, was it a couple summers ago when E3 still ran its last thing? <laughs> uh, it was... I think shown off at the Upload VR when we were catching all the the VR based and PC based uh, press conferences, and it was like, oh, it's a stealth. Uh, you're in a boat stealth shooter game, but looks way higher budget than most VR. We at least we had seen it up to that point, and we had sort of discussed internally when we did our roundtable discussion uh, about E3, like, hey, if we were going to get VR, this might be one we want to check out. Well, we finally were able to. And uh, interestingly enough, when we received the code and activated it uh, for the Oculus Quest 2 through the Oculus Store, it installed just fine, but uh, checked after installing the Oculus app on PC uh, so that we could do some uh, Oculus Link action for some PC games that we might have already owned. And I went through there. It, went, it was actually a game that was uh, automatically... Uh, reduced its price from retail to free because we had activated the code on uh, the Oculus Store for the Oculus device itself. So it's or sort of a cross-buy. So there's two. There's a native Oculus version that uses that runs directly on the Oculus hardware. And there is, uh, at least from what I can see, a cross-buy option where it automatically gives you the PC version that uses the Oculus or other VR headset as... Uh, uh, I guess why well, we use Oculus Link as far as the uh, the PC would run all the, all the computations. So we tried it in both modes or both versions of the game, and because uh, I, I got to say that it worked pretty much flawless on uh, on startup on the native version playing directly off the headset. Uh, it took a bit of getting used to, as this is again, you know, our first two forays. Uh, pretty much into the VR realm. So figuring out, oh, it's, I press this button and reach down and pick something up, and then realizing, oh man, I actually have to row. And you don't think that that's hard because you're not carrying the uh, the actual oar. And then you realize, oh, wait a minute, I'm doing this a lot for the game. So you're getting exercise while you're playing. It also uh, helps that it's, it's a slower moving game, that it, it, it allows for more stealth. It obviously is the whole point of it. But uh, I was like, I'm getting a workout and playing a game. I'm winning. <laughs> uh, and the physics are just so good. So, like, I got too close to the side of uh, the, the rock wall, and I was like, oh, man, I got I to gotta figure out how to paddle my way out. Wait a minute. I can just pick up the paddle and push it to the side, and I pushed myself off the wall. And I was like, oh, man, it takes into account all of this. I mean, this is such a, a whole new realm of everything for us uh, because – you know, I have to. I had to think differently than I would playing a regular game. I had to think of what would I do in real life, and pretty much if you would do it in real life or you could do it in real life, it worked in the game. And I was like, yes, this is what I've been hoping for VR to be, <laughs> and it has fully, 
fully surpassed my expectations on that part alone. The game is uh, takes place mostly in the dark, and that is is a benefit to not just being stealth, but also obviously uh, it benefits the hardware in that it, there's less uh, color and detail, distance, and everything that it has to uh, compute, which really helps, I think, with the the Oculus uh, version as far as like the native version calculating everything which it handles just fine like the loading was quick i didn't encounter any stuttering because you remember it's having to do what is it 1440p or 1800p whatever it is per eye um it, so it's doing above technically i guess above 4k because it's doubling has to do each eye has to do 74 hertz so it means like 144 hertz that it has to maintain without dropping or you'll get like weird jittering or uh screen door effects and it had no problem there um as i found uh aiming the gun i had to figure out how to aim and and see through the uh the scope and the reticle that took a bit of getting used to because it's one-handed how you do it but once you get maybe 20 minutes into gameplay you get used to all the controls and i was taking breaks at every half hour just to stretch because i'm like man i'm getting a workout (laughs) as i said earlier I then went and tried the PC version, or the version that renders on the PC and then uses the uh, the link to, to work. And I was like, "Can my PC run everything at you know? What is it gonna? Is it gonna stutter? Is it gonna have trouble?" And I think because of the dynamic lighting and everything, but the, because it takes place at night for the, these levels and, and it's a lot darker, uh, it had no trouble. I was able to max it out, absolute maximum settings, and go in and. That's one difference, too, is when you play the Oculus version, I didn't see any option to, like, change a lot of the effects and settings. Uh, Whereas when you play the Oculus PC version, where it's on the PC, but then streams it to the Oculus uh, through the the USB-C cable, uh, that gave me a bunch of options for turning off certain effects, uh, atmospheric fog, and yada, yada, yada. I maxed it out, and it took a game that was already really impressive in the standalone version and then just added a bunch of effects that made it look all the more like triple a and i went whoa and it didn't stutter i had no trouble streaming it uh my uh my pc you know handled everything just fine and obviously the battery life went up because it wasn't doing all the internal rendering on the uh device plus being plugged into my computer i made sure a while ago that i had put into one of the pci express slots a uh, a 10G expansion card, so there's a USB-C 10G, uh, and but I had it plugged in to the 5G USB-A on there, um, a, which was an A to C cable, uh, because the 5G uh, has extra power. It has like a Molex connector connected to the the um, to the power supply, which can power up to three amps. So I was able to maintain the charge of the device while playing. At the same time, so you know, if you got like a 15 foot cable connected and you're playing, you could play pretty much indefinitely. You know, as long as the power doesn't go out in your house and, and your computer turn off, you could just keep going and going and going if you wanted to. Uh, very high production values, uh, well put together. It's it's a good example of smart gameplay design and fully worth. You know, it, it, most of these games that I've noticed now on the Oculus Store, they're ranging anywhere from $35 to $45 in there. It's going to depend, obviously, on your market, like if you're in Canada, States, somewhere else. Uh, and these ones are considered, like, the more top-tier titles, and it's definitely worth every penny because you're getting, a, in my mind, a AAA experience when it comes to uh, VR. Well worth it. Definitely check it out if you've got a, uh, a Oculus headset. Those magnificent bastards! Color me kooky, but something very odd is going on around here. You're not allowed to talk anymore. And that's going to do it for the show this week. What do we have coming up? Well, I've got a bunch more VR reviews that I'm working on. Uh, I have... uh, You know, I sent feelers out once we got the hardware, and as you heard here, we had a few come in. Well, even more have come. So uh, I'm working on uh, reviews of B-Team and Path of the Warrior from Twisted Pixel Games. Those are uh, two VR titles. 
Uh, there is... What else we got here that I know has come in? Uh, Synth Riders, as well as some of the expansion packs for it, music-wise, which is always great uh, to see one of those rhythm exercise type games. We've got uh, Onward, which is a shooter, a first-person shooter game. We've also got uh, Traffic Jams, which just released. Uh, it's a VR title. We've got some uh, review accessories coming from uh, VR Cover uh, to check out. We've also got... Uh, just came in. This is a, a regular thing. This is the uh, Atelier Mysterious Trilogy DX on PlayStation 4. So that's going to be a bit to get through. Uh, we've also got... Um, Poison Control on PS4 just launched and we got a review code day of release so that's going to be a little bit till we can get through it and uh, have it out uh, we've also got uh, the another VR title just came in which is uh, Warplanes World War 1 Fighters for Oculus and I know Birdman is working on a few movies I think that he received reviews for uh, that he's starting to work on now that he's feeling just ever so slightly better. I know he had a rough go again. Uh, it's going to be off and on for him, but we'll see if he's able to get a review out. If not, it'll be more of me next week. And uh, as far as the rest of the show, I'm editing another 10 episodes of the Earth vs. Soup podcast that Aaron and his wife put out. Uh, wife Darlene. They've been putting out some fascinating reviews on, on some of these weird B movies from the fifties and sixties. Uh, he, we're going to have close to, by the time this is released 30 or so episodes edited and ready for schedule. Uh, it's going to be in, over the course of the summer. It's right now it's every other week. Then we're going to have it every week. And then over the course of the summer, when usually things are a little lighter, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, we're going to have two reviews out uh, of, the, of these movies and two discussions and that might go, depending on if he keeps putting out a few episodes a week that he's recording, that might go in perpetuity. We'll see how long. <laughs> but we're already at nearly 30 reviews or 30 podcasts, and it's it's you know quite daunting to, <laughs> to edit and schedule all of them, but I'm going to keep doing them if he keeps making them. So there's that. Uh, the end of the month, uh, as it approaches, we'll, we'll see about doing a uh, Sunday Funnies uh, show. We'll see maybe about doing... Uh, a, another, I don't know about Future Imperfect till Birdman is back, but we'll see about doing uh, more loose cannons. I've received three movies in the mail uh, just recently, as in like yesterday. So we've got uh, Minor Premise, Jungle Trap, and uh, Jeremy. Those are from uh, Utopia releasing, Fun City Editions, and the... Uh, the uh, Agfa and uh, Bleeding Skull. So, a bunch of weird releases that we'll be going over. I'm not sure if it's going to be, like I said, a Future Imperfect, uh, or sorry, a uh, Loose Cannon, or if that will just be a regular uh, show, or if that's going to be a Turtle Treasure episode, a review episode. It's all going to depend on who we can gather, and, and so on and so forth. And that's pretty much been it. I Like I said, I've been sleeping the last few days because uh, of recovering from my COVID shot, which it, you know, is good. I go back for my second one in July. If you're wondering why it's so long, it's because in Canada they don't have enough shots for everybody. So <laughs> we're waiting a few months. But I got my first shot, which is good. So Birdman has to wait on his because he has to wait till he feels better and his his levels come back to normal and he has some gallbladder stuff worked out. But uh, that is it. We've got other stuff probably in the works, but. It's uh, getting back to business as usual as far as being busy. The last few weeks was sort of slow. And uh, we should have regular shows out on Monday. I believe we're going to be syndicating more episodes of Nerd and Third Power. One came out last week. We'll have probably another one this week on Friday. And we'll see uh, what Billy's release schedule, what uh, uh, Dr. Gonzo's release schedule is like uh, moving forward. I'm thinking probably Fridays. Like They'll release their episode and we'll have it out on Fridays. Um, after they've got it out because it takes a little time to syndicate that and uh we'll see from there but you're looking at at least two to three episodes a week of different things moving forward probably even more during the summer so yay fun let's get excited and uh that's gonna do it for the show this week uh, i guess i'll be back let me think do i have anything that I recorded pre-recorded earlier no i will be back on the regular time slot this coming monday at no point in your rambling incoherent response 
were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought? Thanks for listening to this episode of This Week in Geek. Hungry for more? Check out our website at thisweekingeek.net. You can subscribe to the podcast, browse our Twitter and Instagram, and leave your thoughts on today's topics. If you'd like to give us some feedback, send us an email at feedback at thisweekingeek.net. Tune in next time, and remember, lower your shields and surrender your listenership. We would be honored if you would join us. Thank you for your cooperation. Good night.